thank you so much for coming, those in person, and thank you so much for joining everyone uh, on Zoom and uh, in the cyberspace. My name is Robin Rydell. I'm a fellow with the World Economic Forum and a partner at McKinsey, and uh, it's my honor today to kind of guide us through this session on the World Economic Forum Target True Zero Initiative around novel propulsion and aviation. So for today, we uh, have a number of things we're going to go through. We're going to start with David Hyde, who leads this uh, program at the World Economic Forum to give some opening remarks. We'll then have Rob Miller from Cambridge University and the Whittle Lab share some thoughts on the technical work he's done uh, with his team on this topic in the last couple of months. And then um, we'll have a demand statement announcement by you know, a set of airlines who are looking forward to have this technology come out. So that's going to be uh, presented by David afterwards. And then we'll jump into a panel discussion uh, with a group of leaders in this space to talk about what does novel propulsion you know, have as a promise and uh, you know, what can we look forward to, but also what are some of the challenges um, with it. And then last but not least, we're going to have one of the um, members of Target True Zero make an announcement around you know, an aircraft that uh, they're going to bring to market. So we very much look forward to that. So with that, David, uh, please uh, open us up. Thanks, Robin, and good morning, everyone. As Robin said, I'm David Hyde, and I lead the World Economic Forum's Target True Zero initiative. Um, I'd like to thank all of you in the room for coming to our first ever in-person Target True Zero event, and thanks for everyone online for joining as well. Um, so I'm assuming most of you know, but Target True Zero is an initiative of the World Economic Forum focused on the role of novel propulsion in aviation. And this is obviously a very exciting time to be involved with novel propulsion. It seems like there's a new announcement every week. Um, there's a whole range of new companies getting into this space, as well as a lot of work by the incumbent industry as well. But alongside all of this excitement, actually a lot of the work that's being done is really important. I think we can see from the turnout today, the, the attention that's been focused on COP, and the general focus on aviation and sustainability in general, that this is a really important issue and that if we are to address the impacts of climate change, we need to start taking action now. And that's especially true for aviation, which is one of the hardest to abate sectors. As an industry, we've come a long way. Um, just last month, uh, IATA and ATAG demonstrated that the whole industry has now realized the importance of moving towards a net zero aviation system. And in this last year, we've seen a whole slew of announcements around sustainable aviation fuel which is really starting to pave a way for how we can reach those goals, those mid-century goals we've set as an industry. But the scale of the challenge mean, means we need to keep up um, being ambitious and push at the boundaries to get as far along in our decarbonization and our climate change, um, addressing those impacts as we can. Some of the technology we're going to talk about today holds huge potential for reducing the environmental impacts of aviation and can play a really important role alongside sustainable aviation fuels in helping aviation transition to a carbon neutral sector. But that's not to say that any of this is going to be easy and that there's not a lot of uncertainty which we still need to address. And that's really what Target True Zero was set up to address. By bringing together players from all across the industry, including the established OEMs, the disruptors, airlines, airports, as well as the other stakeholders using the forum's convening power, we can start to address some of these unknowns and develop fact-based perspectives that will help build consensus on how we utilize novel propulsion within aviation. We hope to be a thought leader in this area going forward, and this discussion is hopefully a preview of some of those issues that we will address as a community in the future. Um, with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Robin to introduce um, the rest of today. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. So one of the big unknowns, I think, around novel propulsion is what is technically actually feasible and what are some of the uncertainties within that. So as part of Target True Zero, we've kicked off some work around how do we think about novel propulsion? What are those systems? What can they potentially deliver? And what's kind of unrealistic within that? So it's my real pleasure to invite Rob Miller to share some of the initial insights from that research. Rob, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Robin, uh, to talk today and share some of, some of the insight from the team. Um, so if, if, uh, uh, in this project, we've built really a model that works for the whole system, because you've got to think about these problems at a system-of-systems basis. 
And we believe that only through a model such as this, released to the public, can anyone from a clever school child to uh, a, a person in government to a CEO see their place within the bigger system? As David Mackay, as I'm sure many of you know, with his carbon calculator on the Bayes website, has, has done, that has really changed the, the way the public engage with land-based energy. And, and we're doing a similar thing. So this, when it's released in a few months, will be the front page. The model is evidence-based, whole system, and interactive, and you can, you can start the journey by clicking on it, and I'll, I'll share a journey as we go. The, the, the model starts with resource in. So you've got your land use, your electricity, your water in. Then you've got to work out how you produce your fuel. So all the fuel routes have to be modelled. We have to understand the TRLs. We have to understand the cost basis of each route. We then go through distribution into airports, journey, from journey to network and from network to climate impact, to, to, to forcing to contrails. You have to model all that. So we're not talking well to wake. We're, we're talking resource to climate. It's a much bigger question than well to wake. So to, to do this, you need two things. And the, the first thing is you need good data in. And through all of you as a community, we've assembled a fantastic data set. So the technology questionnaires, over 80 have gone out. And those technology questionnaires allow us to work out what the value of something is now, 2035, 2050, to determine the uncertainty, how that varies over time, and how the confidence of the person answering it varies. And unless you understand that statistically, it's hard to be able to judge uncertainty into the future. The second thing is you need deep technology knowledge and deep social knowledge from a range of areas. And as you'll see here, the partners involve people from business schools to policy to chemical engineering plants. And the industry partners so far are people who not, don't just meet us once every three months. We have access to their deep technology team, so we can ask them questions. Because the sum of technologies don't make a plane. It's, it, it's a very technically constrained problem to get right. So you have to be right at the heart of your model. So, before I go in and show you a sort of journey through the model and show you some of the insights, I think, that we've come out with Target True Zero, I, you're not expected to read all of this, but this gives you an idea of the fidelity of the model. So what you see across the top here is ground-based emissions and in-flight emissions of greenhouse gas. So everything from making the plane, making the fuel, leaks of hydrogen, through uh, uh, water vapour, CO2 in flight. Across the top row, you see um, the fossil fuel. So that's current. And there's two sizes of circle. The inner circle is the minimum, and the larger circle, the outside circle, is the maximum. So this is showing uncertainty through the model. And as you see, we go down through biofuels, power to liquids, green and blue hydrogen, down to battery electric. And you can see we colour all the other circles green if they're better than the baseline and red if they're worse. And one of the key takeaways here is the, there's a lot of things that are better than the current situation, but the uncertainties are incredibly large in the bars. And what we haven't got on here, this is greenhouse gas effects, we haven't got on here contrails. If you add in contrails, the picture becomes quite different. The uncertainty involved in those contrails is large. You may have ways of avoiding them, avoiding those contrails in flight, flying different routes, changing altitudes. There's all ways of playing with that game. So in a way, it's not as important as the first, but it's critically important if you're going to solve the real problem. And look at the size of the uncertainties that come in. And as you move from CO2, from kerosene contrails to hydrogen, there is literally nothing but computational data. There's no real data on that. So the uncertainties are incredibly large. OK, so that shows you the fidelity of the model. I thought I, we'd take you through a trip. And I, I, we decided to run Washington to COP. And this is like the model is uh, like kayak.com or Google Flights. You know, you log on, you remember the public, and you say, I want to go from here to here. I'd like to do it direct. Now, you don't have to do it direct. If you put on the model, I'd like a number of stops, 
it might select you flying the first leg battery electric into a hydrogen, into a SAF route. It will find the route that's best for you. And equally, airlines can run their whole models through this. So we've run models, we ran a Qantas model through it uh, to optimize that. And you could run regions like Europe through it if you want for, for, for total flights. I've selected here direct because we're flying over water. Where it differs from Google Flights is you can put in your future year. So I've put in 2035 here. And the reason for that is because it's a midpoint, but also because it's the point when companies like Airbus say Zero E will be coming in. So that's when your hydrogen aircraft start to come in at scale. And that's also when we have the transition probably from blue to green hydrogen at scale. So it's a really interesting time. And I've decided to optimize for climate impact. Now, I can just press solve there with standard settings, or I can go into the sub-settings. And in the sub-settings, I could choose the types of planes, the advanced technologies. I could choose whether I put them on the plane. Um, I could choose the number of airports I want to optimize around across the world. I can optimize where my electricity source is from, my fuel type, and my fuel production. So all those things can be changed to select uh, what you're doing. So back to the model. So I'm, I'm going to solve, and I've solved four journeys in 2035 on this route with four different fuels, and I'll compare them. So each one I've saved, and then I've put up four models, which are across the bottom. And the bottom one is a kerosene in 2035. And uh, then the one above is a blue hydrogen, then a green hydrogen, and then a power to liquid with direct air capture. So those model one, model two, model three are, um, are new cases, and then I have my baseline kerosene. So as I've said before, the model goes from resource to climate impact. So we have a look at climate impact first. So if you take... Uh, an economy seat, London, New York at the moment, um, it'll be about just under a thousand kilograms of CO2 for that ticket. This shows that with the data we've collected from the community, it's now set, set about 25% lower in that year if you just continue the same technology. If you go to blue hydrogen, you see a drop, but there's, there's, a, there's a big amount, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in the production, the, the blue bar. And then there's two models, um, the green hydrogen and the power to liquid with direct air capture, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. In terms of resource, you see you've got fossil uh, fuel energy, electricity and land use. The important one to look at here is the electricity for power to liquid and green hydrogen. So you can see they're both big. The green hydrogen is coming out at about 25% less electricity than the power to liquid, but they're both large. Interestingly, if you take the power to liquid, that value, and you scale it across the world, and you try and do today's flights based on a power to liquid DAC solution, that would require 40% more electricity in the world than we currently produce. So the, the, the numbers are quite big, but it's big for hydrogen. There's no, there's no way out of this, this problem. OK, so I'm going to zoom in on the power to liquid and the green hydrogen. So I zoom in on those tickets, and the top ticket uh, um, you can see is power to liquid with direct air capture. So this is electrolysis of water with green, green renewable electricity to produce hydrogen. Direct air capture of carbon, fissure troughs, produce a fuel, swap it into a plane. The bottom one is green hydrogen liquid. You've got to produce a whole new plane to do it. So both are hard, but in different ways. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is under climate impact, above and below the, the bars now, the blue and the yellow bars, you'll see these striped lines. And they're the minimum and the maximum uncertainty bars running through the model. And you see the incredibly large spread in them, especially for the hydrogen combustion case. And so the, the, the key message here is that there is not a clear winner between the two. 
But the, the uncertainty involved at the moment with the best science available is large and needs to be reduced. OK, I'm going to finish off with three insights, I think, from the model. There's been a lot of insights. When you look at it at a whole systems perspective, a lot of things jump out at you. But, but I've, I've gone into three, which I think you might be interested in. So the first one, I've, I've plotted energy requirement in megajoules per passenger kilometer for a kerosene and hydrogen aircraft. So the first one, the first box is 2021 technology. So that's all the technologies we've got at the moment. We put together and build a hydrogen plane, and that's compared against current kerosene. And then 2035, we design. Airbus, for instance, has already announced Embraer the other day. You design a plane to do the, that process. And this would involve, as you see on the right, Hydrogen tanks have to move, the fuel has to move from the wings to the body, the tanks are heavy, the size of the tanks are large. So we'll start off at the beginning. So you've got kerosene, you, you have a three bars for each, and those three bars are the energy that's reduced in flight, in fuel production, and in liquefaction and transport. So if you look at the first one, the hydrogen one, this is taking the plane that currently flies across the uh, transatlantic and putting the hydrogen tanks in it. So it pushes out passengers. You drop out 50% of your passengers. Look at the rise in the energy per passenger mile, the amount of extra renewable electricity you'd have to do. But the uncertainty in our model came through as high as well. So we then took a larger plane that would fly further, but we retrofitted it with the tanks to keep the number of passengers the same as the original kerosene. And look at the way the bar drops in the second one. So there's an incredible sensitivity we saw through the model in the design of the aircraft. So at 2035, so we built into the model an aircraft design system. So now when you choose your technologies and tanks, it designs you an aircraft. And at th that point, see what happens. You find that the hydrogen aircraft at 2035 drops down in energy in flight to very similar to the kerosene aircraft. Remember, the kerosene aircraft dropped by 25% relative to 2021 because the technologies have got better. Um, so the, the key message here is it's important when thinking from a systems perspective that you, you redesign the plane to fit with the technologies that you're putting in. And the other message is that this isn't just the case transatlantic. Because of the lower weight of hydrogen, even when you put the tanks in, there's a good chance that hydrogen aircraft will get better with range. There's still an uncertainty, so we don't know that. But you could see a future where very long-range hydrogen large aircraft are flying between large hubs. And that, that, that is, does seem, from the model, to be a feasible solution within the bounds of the uncertainty. OK, the second one is blue versus green hydrogen. And I've plotted here climate impact in CO2 equivalent. And we've got kerosene, blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen. So I'm starting off with the kerosene case. And you'll see the little green one is the fuel production CO2, then the transport, and then you've got CO2 in flight and non-CO2 in flight, the contrails and other effects. Now, and you'll see the large uncertainty bar on the top. Now, move across the blue hydrogen. Now, you notice that green bar has shot up. And in fact, the green bar in production for the blue hydrogen is nearly as large as the CO2 in flight in a kerosene aircraft. And the uncertainty on it is large. And the reason for that is because of the methane that's released and the CO2 that can't be captured in the process. And when you average that over 100 years, that effect is not far off what the CO2. So a message here is you've got to accelerate green hydrogen through rather than blue. But more importantly, a lot of the fuel routes are doing this. As you're putting different biofuel routes in, it depends where you get your source, whether it comes from waste or from, uh, from biomass. You've got to track where you're transporting it around the world to get to, to, you've got to look at the whole system. OK, so finally, um, battery aircraft range. 
So this looks complicated, but, but actually it's quite a simple story. Um, when we looked at the model, battery electric range comes down to two things. And one, you know, the first one's obvious, which is the energy, specific energy of the batteries. You want the higher specific energy. But also the weight, of the empty weight of the aircraft when you take the batteries off and you take the people off is a key driver, so you're pushing those down. Now, the reason I've shown this is because when we looked at all the data we collected from you as a community, we found a bimodal distribution. So there's a collection of incumbents and OMEs who are sitting on a point which is a higher structural mass and empty weight of aircraft and a lower specific energy of battery, and then a new entrance community who are very different in their beliefs. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, one, one is actually certified aircraft, but the other one is vertically integrating these things to make technology breakthroughs. And, and this has a, a massively non-linear effect on the range you can get out of these aircraft. So the diagram shows maximum range on the, on the left y-axis and maximum operating range on the right y-axis. So we've taken out the reserve. It's, it's, it's up to argument what that reserve would be, but we've set it this value. The red, all the red is community one, the OMEs data sheets that have come in. And you see they're saying a certain weight of aircraft. And then they've got a certain spread of battery density, which they believe. And then you've got community two, which is saying uh, that shifted across and is a lower weight aircraft. And when you look at the difference between these, you, you see you move from an aircraft that's probably about 100 miles range and is useless to one that's going up to more like close to 200 kilometres operating range. And I think what's important here to understand is how technology focus within the new, in, new entrant community can unlock change. Unless you really concentrate on vertical integration on some of these problems, you're not going to unlock these changes. So, um, to conclude, while there's no clear winner between the different paths yet, the model shows immense opportunity can be unlocked through focused technology development. And we believe a key un the key to unlocking change is to engage all of you and the wider community in an interactive, evidence-based whole system understanding of the aviation sector. If you're interested in getting involved with the model, please do contact Beth on uh, Beth Barker on, on this email address, and, and, and we'd love to have you as involved as you want to be. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Rob, and uh, for all your leadership. and. Uh, you know, presenting today and also building, uh, building the model and uh, driving the thinking forward on that, very helpful. With that, I think, you know, we've heard the technology side. I think next we're gonna talk about the demand side. And there's a number of airlines out there who have made announcements around wanting this technology, who've made orders. And David is now gonna share uh, a demand statement by a set of airlines who through Target True Zero have come together to, you know, make a statement around this. David, please. Thanks, Robin. So, um, hi again, everyone. I'm very pleased to um, use this event today to share what we think is the first ever announcement by airlines to utilize novel propulsion systems to address their climate change impacts. So for this, we brought together a coalition of airlines right across the sector representing international carriers, um, larger low cost carriers, all the way down to regional and commuter airlines. Um, those airlines represent over 800, sorry, operate over 800 aircraft currently, um, transported over 177 million passengers um, in 2019, and on almost 2 million flights. So it, it's, a, it's a really significant group of airlines we've managed to bring together for this. Um, these airlines recognize the um, importance of novel, propul novel propulsion if we are to attempt to tackle climate change as an industry. Um, and looking at some of the success we've had with SAF and demand statements there, these airlines feel that we need to show the same ambition when it comes to utilizing novel propulsion. So to do that, they made various commitments. The first is to evaluate how their existing and future route networks can be optimized to make use of these technologies. 
Um, the second, and, and this is obviously the, the big headline commitment, is working towards 30% of the aircraft they incorporate into their fleets for the shorter range routes from 2030 onwards, utilizing novel propulsion um, systems, recognizing that it's going to be these shorter routes where the innovations are, are going to take place first. But hopefully, as the technology matures, we can also see that same goal realized for longer range aircraft. These aircraft are obviously understand we need to use a portfolio approach if we are going to introduce these technologies. So looking at both new aircraft ac acquisitions as well as the retrofit of their existing fleets. And finally, they're committed to supporting the development of these technologies by continuing to work with Target True Zero and the World Economic Forum and engaging with other stakeholders too. These airlines also realize, however, that um, achieving these, these goals can't be done alone. Um, so, in making this commitment, we are, us and them are also asking for other stakeholders to play their part in helping realizing the, the opportunities that these technologies present. So we have asked the government to set the re regulatory and policy frameworks that will allow this goal to be met, as well as other parts of the industry as well. So that's aerospace manufacturers who will be, have to produce these vehicles, um, as well as airports who can help set incentives for them to be operated. And finally, for other airlines as well to, to join this community and really send that demand signal that airlines do want to make use of these technologies as and when they become available. Um, so I'd just like to finish with, um, obviously, these are the airlines we have um, taken part. Very excited to see, as I said, such a range of players from across the industry, um, both household names, but also a lot of innovative smaller airlines as well who are really looking to capitalize on the potential that these technologies have to offer. Um, so, thank you very much, and back over to you, Robin. Thank, thank you so much, David, and thank you so much for the airlines who are also in the room today for, for joining this, uh, this commitment. I think it's a strong signal for the community that there is a real need and a real want for these type of solutions, so thank you. All right, with that, we're going to move into the panel part of this, uh, this day, and I'm excited to invite our panelists up here. Um, so please, please join me at the front, and I'll quickly do the introductions here. So we'll have, uh, oh, we'll, we'll start with uh, David Morgan of EasyJet. We have Diana from Alaska Airlines. Mark from Airbus. We got Roy. All right. <laughs> we got John from Universal Hydrogen. <laughs> Roy from MagniX, uh, and, and Sergey from Zero Avia. So thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this discussion, and thank you for your leadership in this industry. So maybe to get us kicked off, let me ask you what might seem like a simple question, um, but obviously it's loaded. And so what are some of the biggest challenges that you know, we're facing and you're facing from your organization's point of view as we think about novel propulsion and going to you know, true zero kind of solutions? And why don't we just start with you, John, and we'll, we'll go down the, down the line. Robin, that, that's such a, a negative <coughs> question to start with. What are the problems? I, I mean, I think we should start with, you know, what are the opportunities? And you look at this panel, everything you need for true zero uh, carbon aviation is here. You have the airline customers, you have motor propulsion, you have the airframers, you have the startups building, building zero carbon pl planes. Uh, so I'm not going to take the bait on that one, Robin. Uh, we've got everything we need here to, make, to be successful. Thank you for that framing. <laughs> I love the optimism from John. I'll come up with perhaps some, some, some challenges from, from a, a, a kind of short, medium haul airline perspective where I think we're probably looking at hydrogen as, as being the sort of mainstay um, uh, for us. And I think getting the, the infrastructure in place the, to, to scale up green hydrogen will be one of the biggest challenges. Um, it's, it'll be great having an, uh, a zero emissions uh, hydrogen aircraft, but if there's, there's not a sufficient supply of, of uh, affordable green hydrogen available, then, then the thing doesn't work. Um, I think, you know, secondly, getting the, the investment in the tech uh, right at this early stage is going to be vitally important because it's this next few years that actually really count, uh, and it's going to take some years to productionize and certify and do all the other stuff you have to do to put an aircraft on the line. So th this next few years is going to be really important. So we need, we need lots of investment. We need government support and so on to, to actually start looking at the detail with all the, the fuel tanks and everything else that we've got to do to make this all happen. 
And then I think finally, getting the right regulatory framework uh, in order to make sure that, that uh, early adopters of this tech are not <coughs> advantaged by doing so. I think it would be you know, uh, unthinkable that you, you, you go out and you, you, you try and, and do, the, do the right thing, but you're operating more expensively perhaps than, than, a, than a competitor that's decided to sit back and do nothing and is just accepting that, okay, I'll take a bit of taxation, but I'm done kind of thing. So we've got to make sure that the right regulatory framework is in place to be able to make sure that we're not disadvantaged for that. Thank you for that. Diana? Well, from another operator's perspective, and for those of you that don't know Alaska Airlines, we're the fifth largest airline in the United States. Um, we fly largely domestically as well as in North America. We did have one of our uh, uh, liveries on the ground here in Glasgow a couple weeks ago for the Boeing Eco Demonstrator, so that was fun. Um, but similarly, the, the economics just have to work. That's sort of baseline, I think, and the same goes for SAF as well, but on all of these technologies, we've got to figure out the long-term economics. There's a couple of other things that I'd add just to build on those comments. One is, um, you know, we have a, a great set of orders for future airplanes. We, um, we need a retrofit solution as well as new technology for new aircraft because you don't change over um, aircraft uh, that are working well and there's a different sustainability problem with retiring aircraft early. Um, we're thrilled to bring the Boeing MAX into our fleet right now, but as we look to our regional fleet, we want to continue to evolve that, and that's <coughs> got to include a retrofit solution. The two other things um, that I would add, one is the infrastructure on the ground so that we can make all options available, but efficiently within airports. Um, we don't want airport costs just to go up um, as a way of, of moving toward this future. And then certainly on the certification side, um, making sure that we are investing in sort of the right knowledge and capacity at certification entities um, around the world so that these technologies can be um, brought into the pipeline efficiently. Thank you. Having heard from the operators here, uh, Mark, as, as yeah. the big OEM, what's your view? Yeah, but it's good to listen to the uh, operators. <laughs> it gives us uh, even more enthusiasm to, to go in this mm -hmm. direction of uh, true zero aircraft. Uh, as you know, in Airbus, we are working on, on three concepts today uh, for introducing the first commercial aircraft, which is really zero emission. And when we say zero emission, it's not only uh, zero CO2 emission, but we are looking at the other emissions, NOx, and we are looking at contrails so that we really have uh, an aircraft with a minimum impact on the environment. Um, to be successful, we have three key pillars to address. The first one is the technology, the second one is the fuel, and the third one is what we call the ecosystem, which means also uh, all policies and regulation uh, around that. On technology side, as Airbus, we have seen that we have two pathways, huh? uh, sustainable aviation fuel and P2L. For that, uh, we just need to go to 100% SAF capabilities on our aircraft, and uh, we already have uh, flown with uh, a 350, a 319. We are very confident that we'll be able to achieve that before 2030. And the second one is really a step change to go to uh, hydrogen aircraft. And uh, on that, of course, there are some new challenges, but I would say the technology part is totally in our hands. And so we can be very confident in that. And every day, we are more and more confident in the capabilities to, to develop these technologies and, 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 and implement this, this new way of flying in, in, the, in, in the market. And we have billions of it mentioned and hundreds of engineers working on it. On the fuel, uh, we have seen very clearly that uh, we need green hydrogen. Uh, of course, uh, I would say. <laughs> uh, if you don't use a, a decarbonized fuel, you will never go to net zero. And for that, we need indeed a large production of uh, electricity, a decarbonized electricity. This, this is not specific to aviation. Uh, we have to replace 80% of energy which is coming from fossil fuel to a decarbonized world where there is something else. And this something else is decarbonized electricity. <coughs> So the, the amount of investment, and I think the WEF in, in some reports described it very well, the invest in, in new clean energy is, is fundamental for all the economic system. And by the way, the need for trucks will be superior to the need for aviation. Uh, and the need for cars, everybody speak in this uh, COP to, to, to switch electrical, will, will be much higher than the one for aviation. So there is a global uh, issue, which is to be able to switch as fast as possible. 
For us, it's 2035, and uh, we need that time to develop the technology, but it's also the time you need to have this global evolution of the energy supply to be transformed and to be able to produce enough uh, green hydrogen for, for aircraft. It is also, of course, to, to develop the infrastructure, and we are working with airlines and airports to create hydrogen hubs and so create a network. And it will need some time as well, starting with road transport, so these hubs will be to produce hydrogen for, for ground transportation, and we can see a fast development, and then for aviation. And we need some, some regulation, of course. We will have to certify this new technology. We will have to, to uh, have a, a global uh, regulation for the use of hydrogen, uh, the stockage of hydrogen, and so on. And if we could get also some incentives sometimes <laughs> to encourage this, uh, we can see for, for SAF, we do hope that we will have for hydrogen as well. Then we can be successful. So, if we can put this together, and I think we'll put this together, and here again it's not specific to aviation, what we are discussing today, we can go to true zero. Here again, it's not net zero, it's true zero, which makes also a difference, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Roy, as one of the world's largest aviation um, you know, motor manufacturers uh, and leaders, what, what's your view on this overall question of challenges to get to the next level here? My view is we have a lot of excuses. Uh, as an industry, we love to provide a bunch of excuses on why we can't do something. The business case, the SAF isn't in supply, the batteries aren't good enough. I'm 50 years old, and by the time these 2050 commitments that have been said here in Glasgow over the last two weeks happen, I'll be 79. And at that point, I'll have only be able to say, I remember being back then when the commitments were made and no action was taken. And so if we're at COP26, let's talk about policymakers. The way to solve all of the challenges around this, this room is to have policy in place and real policy, not commitments that by 2050 will have less emissions because if there's no action behind it, there's not going to be any action because no one here is incentivized to do it. We all talk the nice talk, but until there's an incentive to do it, it won't be done. And the incentive can be policy. If there's one thing policymakers should be doing, is setting policy. So what if, for example, countries around the world said that by 2030, nine years from now, not 20 years from now or 29 years, but nine years from now by 2030, 10% of worldwide flights by miles must be zero emission. Put a line in the sand. See what happens. The beauty of the free economy is that this group will rise to the occasion. If we are forced by government that 10% of all worldwide mile flights will be done at zero emission, guess what? The operators will come screaming at the rest of the manufacturers here saying, where's my technology? The technology groups will run to the investors and say, show me the money because it's now law. And the investors will know they will have a return because it's law. We have to have policymakers set policy and stop being afraid of putting real lines, not in the sand, but in concrete. Because as long as we try to rely on this being some sort of innovation economy, we'll be at 2050, I'll be 79 years old, and I'll have to embarrassingly tell my grandchildren how we sat here and did nothing but talk. So governments set policy, and we will make sure they are fulfilled. Thank you, Ryan, for that passionate plea. <laughs> Sergey, tough one to follow, but you know, as one of the OEMs that's that's working on a hydrogen retrofit aircraft and powertrain overall, y your perspective? Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's hard, um, you know, to add, um, um, you know, anything on top of uh, this commitment which we uh, heard about and uh, lots of passion which we just uh, heard. Uh, but uh, we are going through this uh, journey uh, of introducing uh, hydrogen electric uh, powertrain into the market, and uh, uh, four things uh, uh, stand out. First of all, of course, the support of uh, R&D, which is needed not only from, uh, from the uh, investors, uh, uh, from the private investors, which uh, we, uh, we are very thankful for, uh, for their support, but also from the governments. Uh, because uh, if you think about this, uh, the new technologies, uh, um, when, when they got developed, for example, you know, the turbines, uh, and uh, you know the, the, the current uh, airspace technology, they came uh, on the back of big military uh, spending, big uh, uh, government and uh, intergovernment uh, uh, spending programs, which uh, very often are missing you know, in what we're doing. 
So again, the support of uh, different uh, R&D programs, and maybe not only hydrogen electric, but uh, also other technologies as well, so that uh, uh, then Rob, when uh, he advises uh, the governments, uh, uh, will have, uh, I guess, more data points and uh, those, um, um, uh, you know, uh, error bars and or uncertainties will shrink uh, to, to the minimum. So. Uh, that uh, when uh, when uh, you advise the government, you can say, okay, this is what works, what what doesn't, because you know from the research, even if it, it was great, uh, all the simulations which you shown uh, uh, today, uh, it's hard to make the policy uh, decision, right? So the second uh, point is uh, the certification efforts which uh, we are going through because uh, uh, the. Um, in order to certify the new powertrain, you need to go through very similar routes to, uh, uh, to the certification of the existing aircraft and the existing powertrains. Uh, but uh, very often the regulation doesn't exist. Okay? So we, we are working with different uh, civil aviation authorities to uh, actually learn the journey, how to actually certify uh, the novel, uh, the novel pro uh, propulsion. Uh, the third thing is, uh, and uh, you know, this is this is great that uh, airlines uh, are you know signing this this these great documents. But I think that uh, it would be great to uh, uh, to hear what uh, what we just uh, heard from Roy that uh, support from the or I incentives uh, from the governments uh, and uh, support from the governments uh, so that. Uh, uh, the uh, airlines uh, are doing it just not from from their goodwill, uh, from the desire to live in a, in a sustainable future, but also, you know, the governments need to show that uh, they are serious. And uh, the last but not the least is, of course, what we already heard today is the infrastructure challenge. So we have already done uh, the the miniature. Uh, holistic uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, ecosystem uh, at uh, one of the small airports uh, here in the UK and uh, we are going to of course uh, do more of that uh, uh, both uh, both here in Europe and the States and uh, uh, around the world but uh, this is uh, uh, you know we need to generate uh, green hydrogen right we need to uh, to make it uh, uh, available and uh, available cheaply okay and so that all the projections uh, or projections which uh, uh, which different uh, um, uh, electrolyzer manufacturers are showing to us, uh, we would like them to be real. Okay, and uh, then uh, the economics will work. The economics will work, and uh, we will see the hydrogen, which is uh, you know projected in ten uh, in ten years to be you know one dollar per uh, per kilogram, and uh, with that we will we will get uh, uh, jet fuel uh, hands down. Thank you. Can I bait you in a uh, in a comment on this, or your? Well, well, I, uh, uh, Roy, you, you you had me at at the no more excuses, but then you lost me when you said, well, but we need policy, which is just another excuse. Uh, there's no excuses at all, and uh, none of these excuses, I think, are are uh, are going to prevent this from happening. Hydrogen production, first of all, it's not going to be at the airports. I mean, in some airports, we'll be able to do it. But look, we're not going to, you say, we, we need the electrolyzers, we're going to build at the airport. That's not how green hydrogen is going to be built. It's going to be producers like Fortescue. It's going to be getting the air liquids to turn around, the shells and the BPs, the people that really know how to make energy. And I mean, not to do a plug, but we just signed a, 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 a MOU with Fortescue. They've agreed to produce hydrogen where aviation needs it, green hydrogen. So production not an excuse. Infrastructure has been the excuse for hydrogen aviation for 40 years. And you can distribute gas. Hydrogen is a gas. You can distribute it the way you distribute every gas through modular storage, which is what we were doing. I will give you hydrogen, Zeravia, Airbus, I will give you hydrogen where you need it, anywhere in the world in the quantities that you need it. There is no infrastructure excuse anymore. There is no aircraft excuse anymore. You've got three people up here building an aircraft that's going to be available uh, it, within the decade. Uh, and, and Roy's Motor too. And Alaska and Raven and Iceland Air and Air Nostrum have committed to fly zero carbon planes. This is happening. There are no more excuses. It's happening. And the people on this panel are making it happen. So these guys deserve the applause. Not Roy. <laughs> Deserve some applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. So to bring back the spirit of collaboration there, 
One question that I have for you guys is, you know, as we're building this community of, of players that need to work together at this ecosystem, what else can we do as, you know, an aerospace industry, but also airlines, you know, um, you know, infrastructure player, airports, to really accelerate that? What are the kind of things that either you wish to see from some of your peers or some of the things you wish, you know, other parts of the ecosystem would step forward with? So maybe we'll start uh, right in the middle with you, Mark, and kind of go, go down to the left and then come over here. I think there is already a big momentum uh, which comes from the uh, airline association and uh, the global surrounding to go to net zero in 2050. So this is the first thing. And uh, I think uh, in, the, in the two last years, this momentum has tremendously increased. And uh, in the aviation sector, I think we, 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 we really are now all convinced um, that uh, we'll have to go in this direction. No, I think it will be built step by step. Uh, and there is a logic behind that. Um, today we are selling aircraft that will fly for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we can see in the first presentation that uh, sustainable aviation fuel first, mm -hmm. coming from the biomass, and then uh, what we call P2L, uh, synthetic fuels could be, could be a good solution to, to, to get closer to, to, to net zero. And uh, with a good fuel, probably we can reach something which is very close to net zero for these aircraft that are uh, sold now. Now we, we know also that uh, the volume of feedstock is limited. To, so we, we have to start with that, but we will reach the limit of that uh, probably quite soon. Uh, and, uh, and there is a, a, a web study showing that uh, coming from biomass, we could reach the limit in, in 2030 which is not that far. Then we have to go to, 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 to P2L. But here again, and it was very well explained, to go to P2L, you, you, you need to produce hydrogen first, then carbon capture, and then put everything. And, uh, and, and, and there, is, there will be a massive demand for that because all, all airlines are committed to go in this direction, which means that it, it will stimulate the production of hydrogen, of green hydrogen. But when you have green uh, production, enough production, why not going directly to, 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 to H2 aircraft? And then you, have, uh, you, you, you start building an ecosystem which is, uh, which is very efficient. So I think the global momentum in, in, is that, including in the energy sector, huh? you, you're right, um, everything is moving in this direction, both for SAF and hydrogen. They, we, you, we are part of the hydrogen council. We can see that in every country in the world, this is developing fast, uh, they have plans. Yeah. So this ecosystem will grow progressively and the momentum I think in, in the industry will come with that step by step and of course as a manufacturer we have convinced we have to convince them that we, we have the technology to do that and then of course in our time scale before 2035 there will be some tests some demonstration to get confident in this new technology and, and be able to put it in the market so this is the vision we have on how it it will happen not in one day but step by step with a, a larger and larger uh, momentum in, in the community. Thank you. Uh, from my perspective, it's really about the practicalities and the realities of the industry. Uh, and as much as I like the example of uh, Washington DC to London, that represents less than 30% of worldwide flights. 70%, over 70% of worldwide flights are less than 1,000 miles in range. In fact, 50% of worldwide flights are less than 500 miles in range. So the majority of people want to and fly short distances. And in fact, the short distances also have alternatives. I came here from Seattle. I had no alternative. I, not true. I could sail. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't the most efficient or productive thing to do had I gone on a three-week or three-month sail trip uh, to arrive here and then back. So flying is an alternative, and it's actually a fairly good alternative, both economically and environmentally, given that there, are, there aren't a lot of options. But when I fly New York to D.C., or LA to San Francisco. There are a lot of alternatives. London to Paris, Manchester, London. There are a lot of alternatives and people still fly. And it's those short routes that the people on this panel have solved. So from that perspective, I would love as an industry for us to stop thinking about the minority of flights that don't have a short-term solution. There will not be an electric 737 for the next 30 years. There won't. There may be a hybrid one, maybe a hydrogen-based one, but an all-electric, pure electric, it won't happen. And so let's focus on what can happen. Let's replace London to Paris, Paris to Nice, Switzerland internal flights, German, UK, US. Let's replace the short flights. It was mentioned that 100 miles isn't a lot. 
5% of worldwide flights are less than 100 miles in range. And they're done with large, inefficient aircraft for those ranges. So I would say as an industry, on the contrary, let's focus on what's practical. If we can, in the next five years, start flying short-range aircraft as electric and let the inefficient large aircraft fly where they are efficient over 1,000 miles, over 2,000 miles, let's at least separate the industry to allow that to happen. That will open up more routes for more people. It will lower the cost of flying, which means more access for more people. The smaller the airplane, the more airports it can fly in and out of, operating again and opening up more access to people. Let's take a practical route to get to zero emission, starting with what's available today and not what may be available 40 years from now. That would be our perspective. Thank you. Sergey? So for us, uh, I would say three words. And um, one is support, believe, and be practical, similar to what uh, Roy just said. So thank you, Alaska, for uh, supporting us and uh, believing in us. Uh, uh, now, uh, on, the, on the practical side, I think it's uh, um, what is important is uh, to make these uh, uh, incremental stage, uh, steps and, uh, and do the demonstrators. And uh, uh, it's great to think about what will happen you know, in 2035 and uh, that we will have big aircraft flying in, uh, in 2050. What we believe in is that uh, if you think about two years ago, nobody talked about hydrogen. Okay, now hydrogen is one of the uh, one of the hardest topics. Uh, uh, but uh, until um, and zero aga included, uh, you know, we started to fly small aircraft. Uh, nobody thought that it was uh, practical. Now. You know, we will work on the 19 seat aircraft, then uh, you know, larger aircraft, and uh, we need to show, uh, we need to do the demonstrators, and uh, uh, and uh, when uh, when we show the big bigger aircraft uh, flying on hydrogen, I think that it will it will bring the step uh, the, the phase transition in uh, in the industry, and uh, there will be lots uh, and lots more believers, and uh, and we will see it uh, it happening. So. Let me go with John and then David and Diana. Well, I um, actually want to respond to that. That uh, you know, hydrogen aviation is not new. It's been around since since the '80s, since the '50s. Um, the excuse has always been the lack of infrastructure and the cost, and those aren't barriers any longer. So it can happen now. So I think the most important thing now is to get that message across. And what are the, what are the barriers to that message, to that truth? Um, I think it's us. I think it's our industry. Um, it's, it's the sort of vested interests in the industry that are unwilling to, to accept a new type of fuel. But to really decarbonize, that's what we need. So I think it's a message problem, both for our industry and then for the general public to explain to them that there are solutions and what those solutions mean and what the safety profile of those solutions are. And also third is, is the regulatory regime. And I think there need to be more regulators. There needs to be more funding of regula regulators because they are overwhelmed right now and there's too much coming at them and that's not a good place for the industry to be. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things from me, really. I think, you know, certainly from an airline's perspective, um, I think the time for talking in high-level rhetoric is, is, is over, frankly, and it's time now to commit um, to, you know, to, to a pathway which is, which is credible. Today, uh, EasyJet committed to join Race to Zero, so we, we are committed to publishing a science-based target trajectory. Um, and I think that's when you can hold yourselves to account and future leaders of the, of, of the, the, the industry and, and uh, uh, to, to account in, in, in delivering on, on those targets. And there's a whole bunch of stuff within that that we're going to have to do right from today, uh, even long before we get to you know, a, a hydrogen aircraft um, you know, along that pathway. And I think you know, just to, to, to throw a, a, a challenge out to my friend on, on the, the shorter range flights, actually you know, uh, airlines like ourselves 
fly a lot of short range flights with big aircraft because that is the most economical way of doing it. So uh, I think we would throw the challenge out to industry to say build us a bigger aircraft, bigger zero emissions aircraft as quickly as you possibly can because we know that's how the numbers work, particularly when you're, you're dealing with, with slot constrained airports in primary airports in cities and so on. Uh, there's a very good reason why we don't see 20 seater aircraft operating into your Paris and London at the moment because there's simply, you know, it, it doesn't work from a, from a, a, an economic perspective. So uh, we, we encourage industry to, to, uh, to, to, to move as quickly as possible into that kind of narrow body range, which will have the, the biggest impact from a climate perspective as well. Anna? Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, I agree with David's point that we are in execution mode. I think a lot of us, um, a lot of our companies, a lot of airlines have put out their goals for where we intend to get, and it's going to take time. But um, but now we're in execution mode, and so you know we are making new commitments and new you know announcements and those sorts of things. But we've got to get stuff done. Um, I would respectfully counter John's assertion that challenges are excuses. I think some of them could be, but if you face them head on as challenges, they really are things you can tackle together. And we'll I think we, we'll you know, at Alaska, we tend to we talk about this idea of realistic optimism. Right, that like we can be optimistic and see the future, but we have to look at sort of dead in the face soberly to understand what the challenges are that we are going to have to overcome to get there. And I think all of us, the places where we agree is that we have to overcome those challenges. Um, so just two other points. I think um, we established a five part path to net zero and we do believe, um, you know, as you said, that all parts of that have to be accomplished. That includes operational efficiency, avoiding using fuel in the first place where we don't have to use it. Um, those aren't sexy changes, but they are very critical percentage changes, meaningful steps. The second one is fleet renewal, which I talked about with bringing the 737-9 into our fleet. The third one, um, sustainable aviation fuel. And we want to get to power to liquid, and we will use what is available today because it's available, and we need to build that market. The fourth is novel propulsion, which is why we're sitting here. Um, and to the point about demonstrations, um, we, uh, Zero Avia is working with a 76 seat aircraft um, uh, for, uh, the, that is an Alaska aircraft to demonstrate the ability to fly that zero emissions um, in the future. And we're really excited to see how that turns out, as well as all of the manufacturers that are represented here, because I think we can create the ecosystem, the supply chain, the, the hydrogen, um, John, as you talked about. Um, and it will take all of those steps to get from here to there. So the last point I'll say, and it kind of um, goes back to the point about messaging, uh, both David and we have guests that fly on our airplanes. Um, and so they, there is a sort of a two-part path to engage guests in, or as we call them, passengers, uh, we call them guests, um, in the journey. Part one is just getting people to care about it. The corporate entities that are flying for business care deeply about avoiding scope three emissions, which are our scope one emissions. We need to make sure that individuals are thinking about that too. And then the second one, um, as you said, John, is helping people understand what technology is available, what it means from a safety and certification perspective. Um, and that's all the way from operational efficiency up through novel propulsion. That's gonna be a journey, but I think it's one that um, we are all on together and helping it seem simple, helping it seem um, uh, accessible and real. Um, we know that our guests actually respond um, more meaningfully to reducing plastic waste than sustainable fuel or novel propulsion because it's something you can see, feel, and touch. And so making um, novel propulsion and sustainable <coughs> fuel equally compelling, I think, is sort of the next part of the challenge. So um, there are a lot of challenges. That doesn't mean that we can uh, sort of say, oh, that means we don't have to do it. It means we've got to saddle up and um, figure out how to tackle them. Thank you. So one, one question I wanted to ask each of you is, if there was one misconception around novel propulsion from your organization's perspective that you would love to clear up with the public, mm. what would it be? The one thing that you feel is either constantly quoted wrong in the media or where there's just a misconception overall. And if there isn't any, that's great. But wanted to open up to you. If there is a misconception you would like to clear up, what would it be? Go around. What was that? The misconception is that it's novel. <laughs> Electric motors have been around for a very, very <laughs> long time. Uh, we each have blenders at home, washing machines, dishwashers. Many of us now have electric cars. 
Electric motors is not a new thing, and it's been around for a long time. We just haven't put them on airplanes yet. In fact, there have been many that have put them on airplanes. But even now, we've, between the group here, we've been flying them for over 18 months now. And I'm not talking about two passenger planes. I'm talking about five, nine, 12 passenger aircraft that have been flying electric. And so the idea of continuously calling it novel and some sort of, oh, that's a cool science fiction thing, is one of the messaging problems. What do you want to call it? A propulsion system, an electric propulsion system. That's it. Uh, and as long as the airlines continue to look at it as novel and maybe one day, then that'll be a challenge. What we need to do is change the way consumers see the options. And as long as we feed them options that are based on today's airline environment, they will continue to see it as some sort of science fiction thing. If we show the flying public what it could look like, flying short distances not from, and you're right, Paris to London, downtown, downtown, is probably not a good example, right? Because you can fill an A320 there every half hour, no problem. But there are multiple routes out there that aren't getting filled and are being canceled. Just this week, multiple airlines have canceled routes to smaller communities across the United States. It's happened here in Europe as well, because it's no longer economic. Well, it's not economic for the people that just lost their one connection to the rest of the economy. They now have to travel for hours on the road to try and get their goods out, their kids to school, whatever their challenge now is. And so the economic aspect is a bigger question than just what makes a dollar for an airline or for a manufacturer. So we need to, as an industry, change that paradigm shift. And so to me, that's the one misconception, that it's some sort of science fiction activity. Very good. Sergey. So for us, uh, of course, working with hydrogen, it's a uh, it's safety uh, uh, topic, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, cars in the streets uh, driving uh, on hydrogen. And uh, we are using, uh, um, I mean, the, the jet fuel is very energy dense. And, uh, you know, we, uh, it's confined in uh, very thin aluminum uh, um, uh, tanks. And uh, nobody's thinking about that, mm -hmm. right? And uh, instead, we're using the tanks, uh, uh, hydrogen tanks, which uh, you know you can shoot a 45 caliber uh, weapon. And uh, you would. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you would. But, uh, and uh, and they, they've been tested, and uh, you know there is no explosion or anything. So the safety concerns, uh, I think, that they need to be uh, fleshed out uh, with the public. And the second thing is, uh, uh, I think that with all the novelty, uh, we have a path to actually make it cheaper. So the, uh, the economic aspect uh, of, of introduction of the novel technologies, right? So it is, uh, it is actually, um, uh, it, it, it's actually, uh, it, it can be a reality that uh, we will save the airlines quite a bit of uh, uh, money to uh, operate uh, our power trains. So those two things, I think, uh, you know, needs to, uh, to, to be fleshed out. Other, other misconceptions you would like to clean up? David. One that it will never happen. It's just too difficult to challenge. And I think, you know, mankind is are fantastic problem solvers. And it just, in the last um, two years alone, we've seen some incredible uh, speed of, of change in technology. And, and everybody's looking for solutions now. So I'm much more optimistic about the rate of change which we will see this technology coming in. Um, uh, th than I was even two years ago. So, you know, if we continue the momentum and it's, you know, stuff like this that we're doing uh, will only will help to support that. So I think, uh, forget that it won't happen. It's going to happen. It's just a question of when it will happen. Mark? Yes, what we observe in the media is a mix of uh, interest and skepticism. Uh, interest, because this is new, and uh, it goes a little bit against, you know, the image of aviation, which is a misconception the benefits of aviation for the economy, for, for, for the, the way of living, uh, mixing the population, uh, unifying the world, etc. I mean, all these benefits are, are, are not very present in, in the global media and so on. And, uh, and, and to propose something and to show that aviation can really uh, be part of this new economy with a, a green mobility is changing a little bit uh, the vision about aviation. But at the same time, there is a reaction of skepticism. Okay, but is it really a reality? 
And we have seen that last year when we have launched these three concepts of aircraft between 100, 200 packs, and uh, 1,000, 2,000 nautical miles, which can be really a, a step change. Uh, we have seen a lot of interest and then a, a wave of skepticism. But I think it's a little bit uh, normal to, 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 to see that. And so I would like today to, 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 to get benefit of this interest. And then, of course, we'll have to, 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 to uh, win trust uh, from our customer first and, and from the public then that, yes, we are able to, to introduce a change and support the trajectory of the operators to really go to, to, to net zero as soon as possible uh, and with passengers that would be proud to fly. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add one. Right. This conversation has made me reflect on the, and I appreciated the messaging point, um, but also, it, I mean, if you think about sort of, we've talked about electric, hydrogen, SAF, PTL, it's confusing. And I think there is a misconception that we're all seeking one right answer. And there's a lot of answers. The one right answer is getting to zero emissions and net zero. And, and I, I say this self-aware that I'm responsible for communications at my company, so I need to work on this myself. Um, but I do think that we have a collective challenge to be able to figure out how to simplify some of how we talk about these technologies so that they can be more easily understood and accepted. Anything you want to add to that, John, from a misconception perspective? No, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's exactly right, and what everyone said. Um, and the question is who the public is, right? Who the publics are, what's, what different spheres we need to influence, and uh, who speaks for the industry and how we can, we can deliver that message that, it's a, that, the, uh, that the effort that the goal is zero carbon aviation, and there are many ways to get there. Uh, so I nominate Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, you had a follow-up? Yeah, just add a, a one point, and it was mentioned briefly on safety. There is a misconception out there that we can do whatever we want. So we can choose to put batteries on a plane, hydrogen on a plane, and sell tickets and have people fly. Aviation is one of the most regulated industries in the world. And you know, if anyone here is an alien and landed on Earth and asked, hey, how do you guys you know, fly around this planet? And we'd say, well, we put you in a little tube, we fill it with one of the most combustible liquids found, and then we light it. <laughs> it would be kind of, OK, I will return to my planet. Uh, but we're used to that. Why? Because the regulatory authorities have required a level of safety in order for people to buy tickets and fly, and we as an industry have adhered to that. The same thing will, hap will happen with electric or the newer or different types of propulsion. It doesn't matter if it's liquid hydrogen, gaseous hydrogen, lithium ion batteries. It doesn't really matter. We will not be able to, as an industry, have anyone buy a ticket on that aircraft before it's been proven to be at least as safe, if not more so, than what's out there today. So that's one misconception that's out there, is that we can do whatever we want. We will have to prove safety before anyone can fly on these aircraft. Well, well said. I know we're about out of time, but there's one last question I want to ask all of you, maybe, maybe briefly, but what gives you optimism and hope that you know, we'll tackle all these challenges and actually get this out there and uh, you know, change the world and decarbonize? Maybe, John, we'll start with you and just go down the... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's everyone in the city today and mm -hmm. uh, everyone protesting and speaking up. I mean, we don't, we don't have a choice anymore, and that's pretty great. Yeah, I think society will demand it from us, and uh, you know you won't be able to, to dodge this any longer. So we, you know we can have to get on with it. But also, on a, I'm, like I mentioned before, I'm just very encouraged by the direction which it's it's uh, it's gathering speed now, and um, I'm very confident that we will be able to solve these issues um, and and perhaps quicker than we expect. Diana? Yeah, I think it's conversations like this. It's the incredibly rapid pace of technology accelerates, accelerating, um, the accelerated interest from policymakers as well. And then um, I passed a group of school kids, Scottish school kids on my way over here that were all wearing capes that they decorated with various messages and a painting of the earth. And um, their minds are pretty open to how we might fly or how we might use energy. And that's great. There's a whole new consumer set that's um, going to learn along with us and uh, be ready to fly these aircraft. Mark? 
Yes, two things. First, in the, this is a must. We have to do so. But uh, as Airbus, you know, as I said, we have hundreds of, uh, of people working on that, on many topics. Um, their enthusiasm, their passion, their creativity, their willingness to really to achieve this. Uh, I think they, 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 they are aware they are part of a very interesting story today, which is, uh, you know, uh, satisfying their engineer side, <laughs> but also to be part of the, the movement of the society. And so the, this, this is a, a strength, I think, uh, in your, your airlines and your different companies. This is a strength uh, to, to, to go forward. But for us, yes, it's, it's really a source of optimism. Roy, what makes you hopeful? The fact that it's not a, an aviation industry initiative. Uh, that's what <laughs> makes me hopeful. Uh, and what I mean by that is, there have been a lot of aviation initiatives in the past. You know, the VLJ, the very light jets that will do air taxi on demand in the 2000s. There's a lot of industry initiatives that fall by the wayside because of our own, to, to John's point, we like the way things are done. I mean, look at the changes that have happened in propulsion, the amazing changes, and I say that tongue in cheek, since 1939, the jet engine is pretty much the same. There have been some incremental improvements, but it's pretty much the same. The turbine or the piston, the same as it was you know, when the Wright brothers started flying, with some incremental changes. The fact that this is now not an industry initiative, this is an industry replying to the generation of my kids who are saying, enough. Right? The demonstrations that happened here last week with, I think they said, 100,000 young people saying, enough to us. You know, enough of saying why you can't do it, just do it. To me, that's what really drives the optimism. Sergey, for closing. For us, uh, awareness of, uh, of the public uh, and, uh, and the support and, uh, uh, and actually commitments by different governments, but also the, the availability of uh, examples which, uh, which come from the different industries. So, for example, Elon Musk is, uh, is, is leading this and then shows that uh, things like uh, you know, bringing completely new technology is, is possible and now everybody, all the big guys are following. And uh, of course for us, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the, the whole ecosystem, aviation ecosystem, starting with, uh, with the airlines, uh, with uh, OEMs, uh, the lessors uh, who support us and, uh, and believe in us, and uh, that uh, we are a part of uh, th this group and, uh, and uh, all the support uh, you know, about which you, you heard in the last couple of weeks, uh, for example, about uh, our uh, small company, they, uh, this, this enthusiasm actually helps us uh, to, uh, to believe that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's doable and uh, we are on the right path. Excellent. Well, on that uh, positive note, thank you very much to the panel. Thank, thank you, you so much for uh, joining us and spending the time and sharing your open opinions. So thank you. Thank you. Now, before we, we close, we have uh, one additional point on the agenda. And, you know, we've a range of members of the community, of course, at Target True Zero. And we've seen a whole bunch of announcements over the last couple of months. So I want to invite one of them up now to share another announcement. So Jeff Angler of Ride Electric, please stand. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna, I want to talk with you all today about the Wright Spirit Aircraft uh, 100 passenger uh, retrofit of a BAE 146. Uh, that we're, uh, we announced last week and that we're targeting entry into service uh, in 2026. So as you all know, 95% um, of the carbon footprint of aerospace comes from large airplanes, uh, Boeing and Airbus sized airplanes. About half of that is wide body airplanes, uh, 747s, 500 passengers. But about half of that is uh, 737s and A320s, um, 100 to 200 passengers. Um, and um, within that market, uh, about half of that is flights shorter than 800 miles. So w the 737 market, uh, just to give you guys a sense of, of how large this is, um, you know, I know this is an aviation audience, but still, over the next uh, 20 years, there's an expectation of uh, 32,000 of these airplanes being purchased. Uh, that's $4 trillion of value. Um, from a carbon footprint perspective, um, these airplanes will, will contribute about as much carbon uh, as, as, as Russia over the same 20-year period. So it's a huge problem, but also it's a major opportunity. And within 737 flights, as I mentioned, half of the flights are shorter than 800 miles. And actually, some of the busiest routes in the world are even just one hour. So I know we, this was mentioned earlier, but 
the busiest route in the world is Seoul to Jeju in Korea, uh, and that's uh, there are 15 million passengers each year. Um, other uh, famous routes, prestige routes like London to Paris, uh, London Amsterdam, even London, for example, to Glasgow. So these are uh, very popular, um, enormous numbers of passengers, and also a huge carbon footprint. Um, but when we talk with airlines, what, what we're hearing is, um, if you want to uh, start to replace the 737s and the A320s, the flights that are the workhorses that are doing these flights, you need three things. Uh, number one, you have to be flying at jet altitudes. Number two, you have to be flying at jet speeds. And number three, you, you need at least 100 passengers. And that's to fit in with their existing business model, to fit in with air traffic control, ground support operations, um, all the things that have been mentioned earlier. So this is an airplane uh, that we announced last week. It's called the Wright Spirit. Um, it's a retrofit of a 100 passenger uh, BAE aircraft. Uh, it was actually headquartered not too far away from here, uh, just outside of Glasgow. Um, the reason that we can do a 100 passenger airplane is because we built the world's most powerful uh, aerospace propulsion system. Um, we announced earlier this year that we began testing a two megawatt motor. Two megawatts is about three times more powerful than any motor, uh, any aerospace propulsive motor uh, that's been out there. Um, and each of the motors in this airplane, so you'll see there's a four engine airplane, each of these motors is about two megawatts, a little bit more powerful, so we'll have to scale up, but it's in the same ballpark. Um, from an engineering perspective, we're taking a very methodical approach. So we've begun testing on the ground, and over the next year we'll be testing both on the ground and in the specialized altitude chamber. In 2023, we'll take one of the engines on this airplane and, and replace it with an electric motor. Uh, that works well because this is an engine that can actually fly on three engine ferry. So it doesn't need all four engines to fly. So we'll start with doing a one engine replacement. In 2024, uh, then we'll do two, two electric motors uh, and two existing jet engines. 2025, it'll be all four, and then we're targeting, as I mentioned, uh, 2026 for entry into service. Um, we're working uh, with two uh, partners who, who signed the pledge, uh, EasyJet and uh, Viva Airbus, EasyJet in Europe, uh, Viva Airbus in Mexico, um, to define requirements uh, and, and set airline expectations. Um, and then in terms of our next steps as a company, uh, we announced on Monday that we're beginning uh, a joint technical assessment phase, or a JTAP, um, an industry term for um, defining requirements uh, and setting the final system architecture. So we've been doing that now for a couple months, um, but um, uh, we, we intend to finish that in uh, the end of, of October of 2022 um, and then officially launch the program. So um, we have a colleague, uh, Taylor from Honeywell, who's going to say a few words about that. Um, and want to thank uh, Target True Zero uh, for the support um, and all the airlines as well. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff and the Wright Electric team for having me here today and inviting me. And thank you all for you know your investment, your commitment to bringing what uh, I think some industry experts are calling aerospace 2.0 forward. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, Taylor Alberstadt, I'm the electric and hybrid electric business development lead at Honeywell. I've been there about 10 years, um, not a long time in terms of some aerospace industry veterans. I think people really get into the industry uh, and are here for decades at a time, but it's over the last few that you've really started to see some change. And it's not just within Honeywell, right? It's not just within aerospace. It's that push that the panel talked about that's coming from outside the industry. And you know, that change is visible, you know, not just within aero trades in the media. It's much broader, right? Non-aerospace news is covering uh, aerospace changes. And just from a Honeywell point of view, right, we're, we're addressing that in three areas. The first is we've set up a UAS, UAM business division, so unmanned aerial systems, urban air mobility, to take Honeywell technology across our portfolio and focus on this new nascent market. The second is technology development for existing products. So if you think about Honeywell's heritage in gas turbine cores, whether that be turboprops, APUs, um, we're using that coupled with new generator development to make turbo generators, right? And that's part of the hybrid electric journey. And then obviously in new technology development, whether that be SAF or SAF blends, if that's fuel cells, we're looking at hydrogen burning cores. So there's a lot of paths to this greener, more sustainable space. 
So just to echo what the panel said to wrap up, right, it's a very exciting time. It's fascinating to see the changes associated and with what needs to happen to go forward. It's inspiring, right? There's a lot of smart minds that aren't, as Roy said, building blenders or washers. This is aerospace. It's a great place to be. So I think that gives us all optimism and we're really going to see those meaty changes in the coming years that lead us to a greener, more sustainable industry. Thank you all. Thank you. And so with that, I think that concludes our meeting today for Target True Zero. I want to thank you all for joining us today. If you are not a member of the Target True Zero community yet, but would like to get involved, David is going to be here, or you can email him, um, and he'll be happy to kind of share with you what Target True Zero is all about and how to, how to join that. So with that, thank you very much for all your passion and the drive to drive this industry forward and get us to True Zero and uh, have a safe and, uh, and pleasant day. Thank you.